Well, hi Gateway and welcome to our third week of the SHAPE course. This week we're looking at personalities and I want to start by giving a big shout out to Dr. Matt Gray from Tabor College. So um, I actually had the honour of being able to do this course with him just last year as part of my Bible College, um, one of my subjects. And I actually didn't think going into it that I was going to learn much. I'm 35 year old, a mature age student. I've been around, I've been in church long enough. I kind of uh, probably in a little bit of pride thought that I um, knew a lot about myself and kind of had a pretty good idea of where God was taking me and have, had a pretty good idea of my calling. But this kind of taught me a lot about myself that I didn't know. Not only did it help me recognize my uh, some of my strengths, but it also helped me um, acknowledge some of my weaknesses and not only acknowledge them, but come to terms with them. And um, it helped me, I suppose, feel a little bit settled about my weaknesses as well. Those areas where I struggle, that it's not too bad. It's not something I need to focus all of my energy on and realize that there's a reason I am weak in areas where someone else is strong. When I look at my marriage, I'm so glad that um, Joe and I are very different because I know in my weak areas, she's strong and not that she has any weaknesses, um, but we complement each other. And that's what we're meant to do in the church. Week one, Pastor Jeremy looked at heart, how God uses our heart's desires and our passions to shape us. Um, and then the second week, also with Pastor Jeremy, we looked at abilities, how God uses our talents or our giftings or um, maybe even our work in the secular world, all these sorts of things, how God shapes us into who we are um, to use us for his will, for his purpose. And again, a thank you to Dr. Matt Gray and also to um, Rick Warren, who, of course, from Saddleback Church in the United States, who created this course in the first place. And it is amazing how God does use um, our previous experiences, which we're going to get into next week. Um, I was friends with a guy who used to spend a lot of his time. He was addicted to um, drugs, but he spent a lot of his time tagging and graffitiing. And, you know, he was a bit of a skateboarder, a BMX rider. And um, when he became a Christian, he was still had those same passions to do what he used to do, but he was able to use it for good. He ended up getting a job in the Salvation Army, Army sorry, with a department who used to go around to um, skate parks and BMX tracks and meet kids and, and use his art, his graffiti skills to use art for good. And he was able to use everything that he used to do um, to glorify God. And just one example of so many, I can tell you how God uses our past, everything we've gone through, good or bad, to shape us into who we are and to lead us into the path that he specifically planned for us long before we were born, um, long before we were thought of from our parents. God had been thinking about us, thinking, I want you so much that I'm going to create you excited um, planning out a past, planning out a purpose, planning out a life for every single one of us. So whoever you are, you're not here by accident. None of us are here by accident. And God uses all things for the good of those who love him. This week was the most eye-opening for me, um, looking at personalities in particular, because I was able to come to terms with my weaknesses. I learned the most about myself, my personality, and I'll go into a little bit more detail in that later. Romans chapter 12 says, for just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ, we, though many, form one body and each member belongs to the others. We have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 says, Just as a body, though one, has many parts, but all its many parts form one body, so it is with Christ, for we were all baptized by one spirit so as to form one body, whether Jews or Gentiles, slave or free, we were all given the one spirit to drink. Even so, the body is not made up of one part, but 
of many. Now, personality, personalities goes into so much more detail than are you an introvert or an extrovert. Um, they seem to be the most obvious examples of different types of personalities, but um, the, we're going to look at a different model uh, tonight. And I just wanted to start off, I suppose, by saying no matter what personality you are, none of us are really just one kind of personality. Most of us are a mixture of different types of personalities. Um, you know, and this isn't in the Bible. So just because it's not biblical, it doesn't mean that it's unbiblical. Um, no matter who you are or what kind of personality that you have, Jesus is always the perfect example, the model student, the person that we look to um, for everything in life. What did Jesus do? How did he do it? How did he act? How did he love? All those sorts of things. No matter what we are, that's who we strive to become like. I kind of find it a little bit amazing how diverse we are. Um, I look at, I've got two nieces who are only a couple years apart who um, the, the oldest is, she's, she's phenomenal, super intelligent. Um, she's got this, she, she knows how to connect with adults like way beyond her years. She knows, she seems to know how adults think and she spends a lot of her time conversing with adults and, and entertaining for adults, making us smile. She also knows how to please us. So she knows the right words to say even when she gets in trouble, she can use it to get out of trouble. And uh, um, then her younger sister, who, not that she's not intelligent, but she's more introverted and she um, has this kind of personality that I, I don't care she doesn't care what the adults think, basically. She is not interested in keeping people happy. She, there's, no, there's nothing fake about her. She is just interested in doing what she wants to do. Um, I get along really, really well with her. It's amazing. But just these two kids that have grown up in the same environment with the exact same parents, around the same family, the same church, around the same people, yet they are so different. And I believe that God, in the diversity of the different personalities throughout the church, um, throughout the world, is showing off his glory and his majesty and his wonder. Sometimes it is tempting to see, look at someone with a different preference or a different style or a different personality and think that because it's different, it's wrong. But a lot of the times, just because something's different, it doesn't mean it's wrong. And again, I want to touch on that throughout the session. So we're going to look at the four temperament theory or also the Latour model, Florence Latour. She was a Christian um, teacher throughout the 20th century. She unfortunately has recently passed away where we look at four um, different types of personalities. So you probably, some of you may have heard of this before, but we look at the sanguine, the melancholic personality, the choleric, and the phlegmatic. First of all, let's jump in and have a look at the sanguine personality. So sanguines are very responsive to the needs of those around them. They generally prefer immediate results. Whatever they have at hand, they will use to solve problems or to be creative. The key word for the sanguine are freedom, story, and action. A couple of their weaknesses is one, they don't like to rest, and they also are not the best in following through in commitments. These are the ones that love to talk. They get energy from being around people, your typical extrovert. They love to tell stories, sometimes stretching them out to be tall stories just to entertain people but they love living in the present. They deep, deeply value happiness and can often see the funny side of a disaster, sometimes causing disaster just to get a reaction. They also love new stuff. As soon as something new and intriguing comes in their radar, they will enthusiastically volunteer. However, they may not well get it finished because they often get really bored quickly and want to go do something else. Watch out for this tendency. The sanguines are usually terrific at making friends. They rarely hold grudges and apologize when they need to and sometimes when they don't need to. However, they thrive on compliments and because of their active nature, they don't necessarily appreciate quiet and reflection, which, which means they can potentially be rather shallow. 
In terms of ministry, you'll probably find a lot of evangelists have a sanguine nature. They're able to get alongside people and make friends almost instantly. They're able to tell the gospel in narrative terms that is really going to bring it to life. But once they have to get into the daily grind of pastoral care and sermon preparation, it's probably time to get someone else in. In the sanguine needs to develop in some of these areas. Sanguines can struggle with Sabbath because they do not respond well to be still and know that I'm God. And they don't like being still. They're too busy having fun. Having said that, the more festive elements of Sabbath are right up their alley. Now, when you're dealing with the sanguine, here are some general rules to remember. Recognize their difficulty in accomplishing tasks. Realize they talk without thinking first. In fact, often talking is thinking for them. Realize that they like variety and flexibility. Help them help stop them from accepting more than they can do to make people like them. And don't expect them to be punctual or reliable, but do suggest that they get a diary. And make sure you praise them in everything they accomplish. For me, the typical example of a sanguine is looking at someone like Josh Katsukas. Josh is your typical sanguine. He could be an evangelist. It is, I love the, the, the fivefold ministry and how different personalities seem to fit these different um, ministries. The Josh, you look at him, he's your typical evangelist. Loves having fun, loves to tell stories. Um, he's so good at meeting people, makes friends so easily. He's someone that you're drawn to, you're attracted to, and and um, the love to teach about Jesus and tell the world about Jesus. Obviously, as I said, some of the weaknesses is they don't necessarily follow through on everything. So it was interesting, especially going through the COVID period. Unfortunately, Josh was pushed into areas that um, weren't necessarily his passions. Now, he did everything without complaining, but for him, it was all go, go, let's go do it now. Let's start. Where is it? What, what do I got to do? Come on, Joel, you're taking too long. And I'm the opposite. I take forever to make decisions. I th have to think about something for days or weeks. Um, Josh's idea, let's do it. Let's go do it now. Let's have fun. Enjoy it. Happy. And that is Josh. Um, Josh is a typical sanguine. All right, I'm going to skip over melancholics for now, but let's look at choleric. So cholerics are the problem solvers. They love to analyze situations and look for new potentials. They love to take people to those new, new potentials. They also want to question the status quo. They want to shake things up and try and find something new and exciting. A couple of their weaknesses, they can seem insensitive, maybe even bully-like, and they can also move on quickly to the next thing. Your cholerics are powerful people. They are the born leaders. They're constantly being active and demanding that others be active too. They can tend to be a little too task orientated and forget that people are involved. But when you're unsure of where to go from here, you can trust a choleric to take you there. They exude confidence, they're independent, and they even occasionally a little standoffish. Constantly looking for things to change and to make better. They are terrific motivators often with an innate ability to see the whole picture and the end prize. They want to delegate and are very intuitive at discerning who is the right person for the job. They can be rather frustrating too. They don't derive identity from friends and can be remarkably insensitive, even bullying. And annoyingly, they are very often right, or at least extremely good at being convincing. In an emergency, you want one of these around because they will naturally set in structures to solve the problem. In fact, they thrive on solving problems. Cholerics often struggle with Sabbath because they want to get things going. They've been told that stopping in its, they have to be told that stopping in itself can be productive. Apostles, the classic pastor leader, are often cholerics. When you are with a choleric, insist on not being bullied. Know that they don't mean to hurt clearly define boundaries and responsibilities and understand they always think that they are right. Realize they think more in terms of tasks than people. When you're dealing with a choleric, the perfect example would be your pastor, Jeremy. He is someone who 
just exudes um, confidence. He radiates life and energy. Uh, people want to be around him. He's visionary. He always has to be doing something. He always has to have a project on the go. And it, he is just someone, obviously everyone here at Gateway is drawn to him for one reason or another. And um, I'm on that board train as well. Pastor Jeremy is your typical choleric. Phlegmatics are the diplomats. When all the others come into conflict, phlegs are able to calm them down and inspire them to further creativity. They think outside the square to solve problems, especially relational problems. Couple of their weaknesses, they can seem lazy and they can be hard to get going. When you need to relax, you wanna unwind and you wanna calm down, find a phleg. They're easy going and relaxed. They're patient and they love to listen. They love to be quiet, but then drop a little line that makes the point subtly and profoundly. Generally, they will look content, but don't be fooled as they always look content. Often they are reasonably happy because they don't get flustered easily, even if they're upset, which they will generally put on a brave face. They can be remarkably adaptable and flexible, which means they can generally be jacks of all trade and masters of none. If nobody else will do it, they'll do it, and reasonably well. They love to solve relational problems, all the while hating that such problems exist at all. When others are angry or upset, that is the most likely time that you'll see a phlegmatic agitator, but only for a second. They are great in high pressure situations because of their ability to rain, remain unflustered and to seemingly just dissolve pressure. They generally have lots of friends, although they can have a tendency to be rather frustratingly lazy. Their classic motto is, if I'm standing up, I might as well sit down. And if I'm sitting down, I might as well be laying down. And if I'm lying down, I might as well have a nap. Phlegmatics make great pastoral care counsellors or spiritual directors with a tremendous ability to listen and draw out from your feelings. They know that one who spares words is knowledgeable and who is cool in spirit has understanding. Phlegmatics are the greatest people at Sabbath on earth. So I'm a typical phlegmatic. That is me. Um, I can be, it's, I take forever to make a decision. And it has been so interesting, so interesting working in the office where you've got Josh a sanguine, uh, Jeremy the choleric, both want to get things done and do it now. And then you've got me who's a phlegmatic who I like to think about things and I take ages to make decisions, which can be a weakness and a strength, obviously. Um, I am hard to motivate, but once I have committed to something, I really want to do a good job. I can be very, very lazy. Um, part of my issue at the moment is that I am scared to stop and rest and relax because I know once I do, it's hard to get up and get motivated again. And so as a phlegmatic, I will keep moving all the time because I want to make sure I don't stop and get to the point where it's too hard to get back up. And so I'll just keep working and working and working. Um, again, yeah, make a, take a long time to make decisions. Um, I, I suppose the hardest part of learning this about me is realizing um, I'm not really your senior leader, like someone like Jeremy or even Josh. I look at these guys and they're leaders, but Jeremy in particular, he's a visionary and um, that is not me, I'm not a visionary. I, I don't really have great vision about creating a project from nothing. Um, what I learn about myself is that I'm a good 2IC. I can be a 2IC and so I see how we work in this church. Although I don't have vision, I can see that Pastor Jeremy has vision, for example, and I buy into his vision and I can gather a team and lead a team to follow that vision and that's where I fit. Um, I used to be upset when I found, you know, thought about this because I thought, you know, I, I want to be a pastor. That means I'm not really the kind of pastor that's going to have his own church one day. Um, and I've learned more and more about that, you know, Pastor Jeremy's more your apostle. I, can't, I don't think he's going to spend all his time just at one church. He's, his feet are too itchy for that. But I might see myself maybe as a, as a campus pastor if Gateway does a church plant somewhere. Um, I might be a campus pastor of one of those plants and I will be a 2IC. 
um, underneath Pastor Jeremy the Apostle. So I can see that kind of happening, but that's the phlegmatic nature. Let's move on to the melancholics. So melancholics, they are precisionists. They get things done right. They are attracted to efficiency and neat sequences because that makes things easier and clearer for everyone else. They're attracted to gradual change, building on what has already happened to make it better. They struggle with the Sabbath and they are not a fan of the stage. If you want it done right, get the melancholic in. They'll drive the sanguines nuts with all their annoying little details, but it will be done right. They're often profoundly talented, as in musicians or artists, they often have this precision next to them. They often are introverted tendencies or to lose energy around people. They can set extremely high standards for themselves and others, to the point where a task is never finished, it is only ever relinquished, which is a problem since they hate having a task unfinished. This can also lead to them having a tendency to deflate other people's energy by constantly pointing out the problems with things. Melancholics are cautious about making friends and hate drawing attention to themselves. And while they can at first be a little prickly, they usually have a tremendous amount of love to give. They are very faithful, will naturally weep with those who weep and love to help figure out solutions to your problems. You can trust a melancholic. They are generally, generally very neat and tidy people and also very efficient, which has its pluses for them, but also means they sometimes don't respond well to rest or things like meditation because it's not by definition meant to be efficient. They can make Sabbath very difficult for them. Um, be still and know that I'm God can be rather irritating to the melancholic. I've been still for five minutes and he's still not here. You often see them being involved in financial things or in the artistic elements of the service, including music, but often to the side if they can. They do want to stay away from the stage. Know that they are often quite sensitive and get hurt easily. Realize that they're usually quite pessimistic and that has its place. Encourage, but never flatter. Give them some space and respect the value of schedules and neatness. So in the office, if you're looking for a melancholic person, we'll probably point to Tonya. Um, she's parts of others as well, but Tonya, thank God, is in the office with me and Pastor Jeremy and Josh. Uh, while we are destroying the place and pulling it apart, she is the glue holding us together, the source of reason, the one who thinks about things before getting them done. She's more likely to make me hurry up and make a decision when it needs to hurry up, but she can also slow down um, your Josh or your Jeremy if they seem to be making decisions too quick and not thinking about things enough. And so um, she is this perfect balance for all four of us. It is amazing how God has brought us all together um, it is amazing how God uses our different personalities, that we'd be different parts of one body, that we would fit together and we would assist each other with our gifts and abilities and different personalities. God has shown off in Gateway when he's, as he's been building this church and bringing us all together and we are different for a reason. When I completed the shape course right at the very end we had to read out just a three minute talk about some of the stuff we'd learnt about ourselves um, to the rest of the class and I just want to read that to you uh, to finish off. I have never found myself to excel at anything in particular. I've always been at okay at whatever I put my hands or my mind to. Sometimes I could even become good at something. I am the proverbial jack of all trades, master of none. In fact, I am a tradesman. I am a carpenter. Even as a youngster, I played sport, but I was never the fastest. When I played music, I was never the first pick. I had to work hard, very hard to get good grades. I could scrape together a distinction every now and then. I am phlegmatic by nature and really have to work hard and to be intentional about whatever I want to do. Where the SHAPE project has helped me is to be able to acknowledge my giftings and come to, term with, come to terms with my weaknesses. My senior pastor is a classic choleric. It is like he was born with an apostolic gift to plant churches. While I talk 
about things that could be done. He is the person that are making sure they get done. This isn't me. I'm a typical tool I see, but I've come to embrace it. When I am under a leader with vision and drive, I can rally a team and I desire to see people thrive. The greatest lesson I've learned is finding my desires when my desires line up with God's will. If I enjoy something, if it serves others and honors God, then it is probably his will. I've previously had struggles with anxiety, depression and addiction. In fact, my whole world was turned upside down nearly three years ago when I was at rehab for young men with mental illness and addiction issues. What I enjoyed the most is to see people suffering through depression set free, find their passion and thrive. And this is where I see my ministry. I believe that I will pastor a church one day. I may be an associate for the rest of my life, but if I get to tell people about Jesus and see people reach their, reach their potential, then I will be honored. Remember, just because someone is different or someone likes something different or prefers something different, just because it's different, it doesn't mean it's wrong. I thank God that we have a church down the road that loves loud music and some people don't like that and they can come across to our church where the music is quieter. But there are people who love loud music and it fits them perfectly. There are people who don't like to sing at all. There are monks that like to go and be by themselves. We all have these different personalities and different preferences and styles of worship. But just because it's different, it doesn't mean it's wrong. God's created us as a body, different parts, different members, one body put together to glorify him. Stay tuned. Experience will be coming up next week. Have a great week. God bless.